Do me a favor before we get into the sermon and take just 30 seconds, and I want you to write down on your uh, little note sheet right here at the top of your note sheet, write down the top three things that you would like God to do in your life. So just take 30 seconds. I'll, I'll give you some time, and then I'll jump into the. Actually, I'll, I'll just open with my first story as you're writing those down, as you're thinking about that. I was uh, out at Lee Summit not long ago. And I was there for the uh, leadership orientation that we did. It's the thing that we do to train all of our leaders. And so there was about 60 people there. And we got done at the end of the uh, session that we did. And, and uh, I made some plans with one of the guys at our Lee Summit campus to go hang out at his house. And so he said, uh, well, just follow me over there. And so I got in my car and he pulled out and I was pulling out of the parking lot. And as soon as I got onto the main street right outside of our Lee Summit campus, I noticed that he was driving really fast. And I didn't remember what kind of car he was driving, and so I was like, I think that's him up there. And so I drove up to this car, and I, I pulled up beside it, and it wasn't him. So I'm like, okay, I, I made plans. Okay, I could probably just call him and see where he's going. Um, and so I picked up my phone, and I started to dial his number, and my phone, the screen went black. You know, like that's the only way we navigate anymore is with our phones, right? What do you do? Your battery, my battery went out. And so I had no way of getting a hold of this guy. I had no way of contacting him. And I was supposed to drive and meet him at his house. Luckily, a minute later, I, I sped up a little bit. And I found that he had pulled off into the parking lot of a high V, And I was able to reunite with him. And we made it to his house. But I realized in that moment, I forgot the importance of having, having a charged battery in my phone, right? Power is a very important thing, isn't it? It's especially true in this digital age where we're kind of always connected to our phones, but it's very important. It's, it, I, I, and I forget how reliant I was on power. For as much as I used my phone, it's, you would think that you could remember to charge your phone in the morning, right? But it's like I had forgotten this truth that power is an extremely important thing. Power is very important in the Christian life as well. A Christian without the power of God cannot live the life that he or she was meant to live. Charles Spurgeon, he's a great preacher. Here's what he said. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind. We're branches without the sap. And like coals without fire, we are useless. And so it's not surprising that as we arrive at the, what I think to be the climax of the letter to the Ephesians, uh, the, uh, as we arrive at this, it is not surprising that Paul, the apostle, prays for power. That's what we're getting into in this passage. Ephesians chapter 3, uh, starting with verse 14, that's where we're going to be but Paul, right here, in this climax of the letter, he's, he's spent the first three chapters in the doctrinal section giving us all the theology of all the blessings and of everything that God has done for us. And we've arrived at the transition of the letter after chapter three, chapters four through six are all gonna be about how do you walk in light of these realities. It's gonna be very practical, chapters four through six. But right here, at the pivot point in the letter, Paul prays for the power of God. When was the last time that you prayed for the power of God? Those three things that you wrote at the top of your outlines, I would guess that for most of us, those are things that you probably cannot accomplish of your own willpower. The things that we want God to do the most in our lives are the things that really, if God doesn't step in and do something, then I'm not going to be able to do this. And so what we need more than anything else is the power of God. Here's what Paul says. Here's what it says in verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. For this reason, Paul prays. So here's number one. We're going to learn about the purpose of Paul's prayer. For this reason, if you noticed last week, uh, back, where, where is it, what is that pointing to? It's pointing back to the beginning of chapter 3, where, which also said, I think it was verse 2, which also said, for this reason, and uh, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and then Paul gets distracted, and he goes on this tangent, 
because he knows he's probably dictating it to a scribe and he, the, you know, he, he kind of gets sidetracked. He's like, I really want the Ephesians to understand the mystery of the gospel. That's what we talked about last week. Reggie preached a great sermon on the mystery of the gospel. And now after this kind of parenthetical section, Paul remembers what he was saying. So he says, for this reason, which points us back to chapter two. What did God do for us in chapter two? He made us into one new humanity in Christ. Jews and Gentiles, all these ethnicities, all these divisions, all of us were made one new humanity in Christ in the church. This totally unparalleled community that had never before been heard of in the history of the world called the church, that is the vehicle through through which God chooses to bless the world, the church. And he says, because of this, for this reason, in light of all these things that I've done for you, in light of the blessings you have in Christ, in light of the fact that you were redeemed by the Son and sealed with the Holy Spirit and given access to the Father, in light of this, I bow my knees before the Father. That's the reason for Paul's prayer that we're talking about here. You'll remember in chapter one, Paul prayed another prayer, but in that chapter, He was praying for enlightenment, that we would know the hope to which God has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us to believe. He's praying that the eyes of our heart would be opened back there in chapter one, but here he is not praying for enlightenment. Paul is praying for empowerment here in chapter three. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles... What is the motivating reason for Paul's prayer? It is the reconciling work that God has done amongst all of humanity. And so because of all these things that you're seated in the heavenly places in Christ, there's these amazing theological truths. For this reason, I bow my knees in prayer and I'm gonna pray for power that these things that you've learned about in your head, that they would get down into this place that actually affects you, that you would have an experiential awareness of these blessings that we have in Christ. And as we listen to Paul, this is very amazing here because Paul, uh, uh, he falls down on his knees before his heavenly father. And we get to eavesdrop on the prayer of the apostle Paul. How did you learn to pray, those of you that have been praying people for a long time? My guess would be that most of you, it was not through a class, it was not through a book, it was not through a lecture. Most of us, the way we learned how to pray was by listening to somebody else pray. I mean, Jesus' disciples, they listened to the way that he was praying and they said, Lord, teach us how to do what you're doing. Because there was something that was so powerful about Jesus' relationship with his heavenly father that they wanted to be a part of that. So we, we learn how to pray by imitating so we would do well today to imitate Paul's prayer in our own prayer lives here in Ephesians chapter three. Paul prays that we would have the power to live it out. That's the reason for his prayer. Here in a moment, he's going to tell us that one of the reasons he's praying is because so many people sell themselves short because God wants immeasurably more for you than you even want for yourself. That's what we're gonna talk about in just a minute in this prayer. God wants so much. There is immeasurably more life in Christ that's available for you than you're even aware of. That's why Paul gets down on his knees to pray because he wants us to understand how much more God wants for us. How much immeasurably more is God's love for us? That's the reason for the prayer, number one. Here's number two, the posture of the prayer. Verse 14, did you notice what it said? I bow my knees before the Father. For first century Jewish men in particular, it, they were not required to bow. In fact, the usual posture for, for prayer would be to stand and pray. That's why Jesus in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, he taught his disciples, he said, when you pray, standing, do not be like the hypocrites. He, he, he kind of assumed the regular posture was going to be standing. But when people did bow in prayer, it wasn't completely unheard of. But when people did bow, what did it mean? It meant earnestness, desperation. This is the posture 
of Paul's prayer. As he bows before his heavenly father, he prays earnestly for these things that are on his heart. And if you've never been a person of prayer, that's a good lesson. That's a good first lesson of how do you, be, how do you actually pray to God? Maybe you haven't prayed to God in years. How do you start? And the very simple way to start is pray what's on your heart. Just share your desires with your heavenly father. Paul consistently does this. In fact, Romans chapter 10 He prays for his fellow Jews who have yet to receive Jesus as their Messiah. And he prays, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. He wants his own people to know God. And it's such a desire of his heart that he shares it with his heavenly father. That's what prayer is on a basic level is simply sharing what's in your heart with your heavenly father. You don't have to pretend to be someone else with God because he sees who you really are anyway. You don't have to try to regurgitate religious language when you pray. It's just, if you're angry at God, tell him. Just pray what's in you, not what you feel like ought to be in you. That's the the first, how we start in prayer. So this is the posture of Paul's prayer. He's down on his knees. And another thing to note is that prayer is a response to what God has done. We don't come to God and just kind of make stuff up. Anything we say to God is a response. Paul says for this reason, he's pointing back to all the things that God has done. And so prayer is a response. Paul teaches theological truth and then he prays. He goes into another theological section and then he prays because he knows that the most important thing is for us to get this down into our hearts and to have an experiential knowledge of it, not just a head knowledge. Prayer is a response to what God has done. Eugene Peterson said it this way, prayer is answering God. And we must understand the overwhelming previousness of God's speech to our prayer. God has spoken. Anything anything else we say is a response. And so when we come to God, we are to approach God with the same posture as the Apostle Paul and say, not my will, but yours be done. It means to pray with humility. That's the next thing on your outlines. It says he bows his knees before the Father. The posture of bowing was a posture of great humility. And so when you pray, pray with brevity. Make your prayers short. Your heavenly Father already knows what you need. Jesus warned his disciples not to be like the pagans who heap up empty phrases and who think they will be heard because of their many words. Ecclesiastes 5.2 warns us not to be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. This posture of humility before God, of bowing our knees before the heavenly Father, of coming before him, it, it ought to lead us to this great humility because God is the Father from whom all of creation and all every family on earth gets its name. So we're going to talk about humility a little bit more next week. I'll save that for next time. Here's number three. Let's actually get into the petition of Paul's prayer. Let's see what he talks about here. What does he ask God for? Three things. First of all, he prays that we would be strengthened with might. Here's what verses 16 and 17 say. Paul prays for that according to the riches of God's glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Wait a minute. I thought Christ was already in my heart. Maybe you'll ask. What does that mean? Isn't Paul praying for people that are already Christians? So why is he asking that they would have the power of God so that Christ may dwell in their hearts? Here's how we answer that question. That word for dwell is a word that means to make one's permanent home somewhere. There's another word for temporary dwelling, but that's not the word that Paul uses here. This word means permanent. That might seem puzzling, but this is a prayer for people that are already believers. Paul is not praying that people's hearts would be open so that they would accept Christ. What he's praying for is that Jesus would feel at home in their hearts. While it is true that when a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells inside a believer, it is also true that the indwelling of Christ is a thing of degrees. 
Let me explain what I mean by this before you email me, disagreeing with me. The word used here for strengthened means fortified, braced, or invigorated. Paul is praying that we would have an inner strengthening so that our hearts would be more and more each day would become a place where Jesus Christ has a comfortable dwelling. Have you ever, let me put it this way. When I first got to Legacy Christian Church, the office that they gave me was very sterile. It had white neon lights and nothing really in it. And so what did I do when I got that office? I made it my own. I kind of put my own stuff up. I put up my bookshelves. I got a nice chair to sit and read and study in. And I I made it my own so that I felt at home in the office. When I bought a house, I came into that house and the first thing that I did, they had this nasty, it was in Phoenix, there was this nasty white carpet that had dog pee all over it. And so what did I do? I ripped out that carpet and I put this nice 20-inch tile on the floor and I decorated it, I painted it the color that I want. I made it my home. I, I decorated it, I made some changes, I renovated it. So what Paul is asking God here is that we would have the power to allow Jesus to make himself at home in our hearts. That's what being a Christian is, by the way. It's, it's telling Jesus that he doesn't have to stay in the guest room anymore, but that now he gets to move in the master room. And I think there's a lot of Christians that have been Christians for a long time, but they have left Jesus. Jesus has moved into their hearts, but they've left him in the guest room. And they haven't really allowed him to make a lot of changes. It's kind of like that person that comes and visits out of town, and we say because of obligation, we say, well, just make yourself at home. But do we really mean that? Do we really want the people that, when we say make yourself at home, do we really want them repainting the room while they stay there? Do we really want them taking all the food out of our refrigerator at night when we're asleep? We don't. But what Paul's praying for is that we would give Jesus, we would allow him to do the renovations in our hearts that need to happen. And According to Paul, what we need to make that happen is we need power. Those changes you know that need to happen in your life, but you just can't do it no matter how hard you try, you need the power of God to renovate your heart so that Jesus feels at home in your hearts. Does he? Or is there bitterness, anger, resentment, lust, decorating the walls of Jesus' living space in your hearts? Let me show you an example. Paul says, we, he prays that we'd be strengthened in our inner being. Um, so I have these two pop cans here. Maybe you've seen this analogy before. I've got these two Coca-Cola cans right here. They look exactly the same, don't they? But one of these cans, these are actually very different because one of these cans, I can squeeze as hard as I can and it will not break. But the other one, I can squeeze and it just crumples. Not because I'm strong, but because I poked a hole in the bottom of the can. And so that's what it means to be strong on the inside. Recently, there was a headline. Did you see this in the the news? There was a headline that mentioned the implosion of a major megachurch in the wake of allegations of misconduct directed towards their lead pastor. Huge news story in the evangelical world. This was a pastor who had spoken for years about leadership and character and integrity. And I I honestly feel bad for this pastor, but there's some serious allegations and serious sins of this guy's life that were revealed in a very public way. But this was the same pastor who wrote a book called Who You Are When No One Else Is Looking, Choosing Character Over Compromise. This was a pastor who everyone looked at, oh, that's the guy who talks about leadership. He's a really strong leader. And on the outside, he looked very strong. But apparently, he was not strong on the inside. So Paul's praying that we would have power, that Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, would strengthen us on the inside so that when we face those critical decisions, we would have the character qualities that make it Jesus comfortable dwelling in our hearts through faith. That's what he's talking about. That's strengthened with might. Here's the second part of this, what Paul prays. He prays that we would be rooted in love. Why do we need to be strengthened with might? So that we can love other people. He prays that you being rooted and grounded in love as we look back 
to this great reconciliation that Jesus has accomplished for us in Ephesians chapter two. There is a tension because a lot of times we still remain divided. But the reason that he prays for this power to transform us is so that we can love each other more deeply, so that these divides would be gone, so that we can live into the reality of this new humanity that God has created for us. And he gives these two analogies, which are awesome, these two metaphors. One of them is organic, so it's kind of like a plant or a tree. And the other one is an architectural analogy. He says, I rooted and established, those two words in the passage. And so it's, it's almost like this organic imagery is basically like the roots of your life are going down into the soil of God's love and drawing up nutrients and you're constantly extending that to other people. Or the architecture analogy is you're building your life on a solid foundation and you will have no stability in your life if you are not deeply grounded on the love of Christ. John Stott uh, says it this way, love is to be the soil in which our lives are rooted. Love is to be the foundation upon which our lives are built. In verse 18, Paul prays that we would have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love that surpasses knowledge. This word for comprehend is an amazing word in the Greek. It's, it, what it means is to take hold of something and to make it your own. So he's praying that we would have power to really have this experience of God's love. And isn't it true that in the church, some people tend to emphasize experience and other traditions tend to emphasize truth? And if you emphasize experience so much, we know that that can be a disaster, right? But if you emphasize truth too much, we know that that can also be problematic. And I think some traditions, it's like we, we're so steeped in truth that we've forgotten that God wants us to experience his love. And we need the power of God to do that. And I love these dimensional words that Paul uses. He says the height and length and depth and uh, the breadth of God's love. And what this means, and then he says, I want you to know the love that surpasses knowledge. How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? What does he mean by that? The fourth century biblical scholar, Jerome, said that the love of Christ reaches up to the holy angels and reaches down to the evil demons of hell. Think about all these amazing dimensions of God's love. Paul wants us to see God's love in 3D, in 4K, in UHD. And he wants us to see God's love like we've never seen it before. And if you think, I want you to think back to the time in your life when you first had an experience of God's love in your heart. Think back to that moment where you first, where God's love first just kind of pierced your soul. And for those of us that have had that experience, what Paul is saying is I want you to know that, that all of those experiences in your life, they pale in comparison to how much God actually loves you. And I pray that you would have the power that you would be able to see and experience God's love in three-dimensional, four-dimensional, multi-dimensional the fact that God's love has breadth means that it includes every individual of every era of every nation on earth. The fact that God's love has length means that there is no length to which it will not go. The fact that God's love has depth means it descended all the way off of the heavenly throne into the human experience and became obedient to death on a cross. The fact that God's love has height means that right now, if you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, you're seated with Jesus in the heavenly places where God's unconditional love is fully, completely filling you and is a deposit guaranteeing the redemption that is to come. Verse 18, look at the next part. How is it possible to know something that surpasses knowledge. Thomas Aquinas was one of the most prolific writers and thinkers of the Middle Ages and one of only 33 doctors in the church. His magnum opus uh, called Summa Theologica is one of history's most exhaustive and enduring theologies. But Aquinas never finished it because something happened. On December 6th, 1273, it, something caused him to stop writing completely. And here's how he describes about this mysterious event that nobody's able to figure out what it was, but here's what he says. All that I have written seems to me like straw compared to what has now been revealed to me. Aquinas scholars have no idea what it was, 
But whatever that discovery was, there was one revelation that surpassed all the other knowledge that he had his entire life. C.S. Lewis said it this way of being pierced by the love of God to the core. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not because I see it, but because by its light I see everything else. Grasping the love of God, it's like that. What happens is this, it's almost as if the sun has risen in your life and you can suddenly see things that you could never see before because you're seeing them through the lens of these new goggles that have been given you. The love of Christ. There's an old hymn. Maybe you've heard this one. Here's how the words go. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every blade of grass a quill or a pen, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. He prays that we would experience the multidimensional love of God. Here's the third thing he prays for, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And right there, he's asking that you would run to God for all the deepest needs of your heart and the deepest needs of your life to be satisfied in God alone. When you truly grasp the love of God, you'll be filled with the power of God. Here's the last thing that I have on the outlines. Number four, uh, we're gonna talk about the praise of Paul's prayer in verse 20. Paul finishes his petition and then begins praising God in his prayer. There's three practical things contained in this short statement of praise that ought to help us pray as we kind of look at his example of a, a man who has spent a life of prayer. The first thing is that when we pray, we must believe that God is able. Those things that you wrote down at the top of your outline, the things that you'd like God to do in your life, do you really believe that he can? Do you really, do you really believe that God is able to do that. This is what the scripture says right here. It says that our God is able, verse 20 says he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think. Those things that we wrote down, the, most, the things that we want most in this life, God looks at those, he's like, I've got so much more for you. If only you would ask, I've got, you have no idea. I, I'm able to do way more than you're ever even willing to ask for or imagine abundantly, exceedingly more. So when we pray, when you get down on your knees, just like Paul did, and you cry out to God and you ask God for these things, believe that you are praying to the creator of all things who is able to do way more than we could ever ask or imagine. F. Dale Bruner, Bible scholar, he said that the first two words of sound Christian theology are God can. Secondly, when we pray, we must trust that God is at work. You may be going through a terrible circumstance in your life, and you may be praying for deliverance from that circumstance, and you might not see any deliverance, but you need to trust when you cry out to God, you need to trust that God is at work according to the power that works within us. In chapter one, we learned about that power. You know what kind of power it is? It's resurrection power. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. There was a story of a vacuum salesman that was going door to door trying to sell vacuums, working on a brand new neighborhood, and he walked up to the doorbell of uh, the house of a newlywed couple. And this woman answers the door, and before she can say anything to this woman's horror, this vacuum cleaner salesman pulls out a, a coffee cup of dirt and, and dirty stuff and dumps it all over her white carpet. And he looks at her, he says, relax, lady, if my vacuum doesn't pick up every speck of this, I will eat it all with a spoon. To which the lady angrily retorted, well, mister, you better start spooning because our electricity hasn't been turned on yet. <laughs> Here's the good news, is that without power in our Christian life, just like that vacuum, it's just useless, Right? But here's the good news is that the power has been turned on in your life. For those of you that are in Christ, the power is on. Yet so many of us are content to live these little 40-watt lives 
when God's billions and billions of voltage of divine illumination are ready to just pour through us and in us and strengthen us and flow out to this world that's sitting in darkness. The word for power there is the word uh, dynamis is where we get our word dynamite. This is a dynamite power of God. And even in your circumstance where you don't see it, God is at work. He is powerful beyond what you could ever imagine. And my friends, the power is turned on So when you pray, even when God doesn't answer the way you want him to answer and he does not deliver you from your circumstance, trust that he is at work. Finally, here's the last thing. When we pray, we should always give God the credit when he answers our prayers. Paul says, now to him be the glory in all generations. What a great ending to the prayer. And I think that's a good pattern for prayer. Whenever you pray publicly out loud, whenever you pray privately, let's try to end our prayers by giving glory to God. And when you pray, maybe write down some of those things that you ask God for. Maybe keep a prayer journal so that you can see the ways that God answers those prayers because I believe that he is a, a powerful God who loves giving good gifts to his children. So when we pray, we should always give God the credit. So look at those three things you wrote down at the top of your outlines. Are these three three things about God's glory or are they about your comfort? Did you pray, Lord, I ask you to heal my body so that I might serve you with greater energy and strength? But Father, if my suffering will bring more glory to your son, then just leave me sick. Not my will, but yours to be done. Anybody pray that prayer? Did you pray, Lord, I ask you to restore or to bless my marriage? Or if you're single, help me find a right marriage partner so I'll be happier here on earth. Not so that I'll be happier, but so that we as a Christian family can be an effective witness for you. Or did you pray something like, Lord, bless my business. Right now I'm being obedient to your word, faithful, bringing my full tithe to the storehouse. But Lord, if you'll bless my business, if you'll provide for my family's needs, My desire to go way beyond, I will go way beyond the tithe. Lord, make me a good steward, a kingdom philanthropist. Help me to wisely steward all my time, gifts, skills, education, resources to glorify your name and to grow your church. This is the pattern of prayer Paul gives us is that we should always pray for things that give God the ultimate glory. That's how you know spiritual maturity is happening in a person's life. When your prayers about your circumstances shift from, Father, deliver me from this, to, Father, be glorified in this. When your prayers start to change to that, you know that spiritual maturity is happening in your life. You're being strengthened by his power in your inner being. When your prayers change to, not my will, but yours be done, So will you pray that way tonight, maybe for the first time in a long time? Will you pray for God's power to experience his love? Will you ask God to transform your heart so that the greatest desire you have is God's glory? That's how Paul ends the prayer. And next week, we're gonna talk about walking in that and what that means practically But at the end of this great section in Ephesians 1 through 3, God gets all the glory because of everything that God's done. And every decision we make is in light of what he has done to redeem us. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for my friends here at Legacy Christian Church. Strengthen us. We get down on our knees and we beg that you would give us the power to enable us to know the height and the length and the depth of your love for us. Oh God, we don't have a clue how much you love us. Even the greatest experiences of this life where we felt the closest to you are just droplets in the ocean of your love. Help us to have power to be strengthened on the inside, not just on the outside. Help us to crave your glory above all else. Heal us. In Jesus' name, amen.